Good morning, everybody. Happy Saturday. Hope it's uh, nice in your part of the world. If you can hear me okay, give me a little thumbs up here. I'm not sure what this little uh, ray, of, ray of light is coming in. It's some kind of a flare from <laughs> up above. It is not sunlight. It is not uh, the heavens opening up. It's just weird. I hope you're doing great. I hope you had a good week. What a weird week this week, this holiday week. Uh, anytime a holiday falls on a Wednesday, it's just so confusing. I can't decide if I'm working or on vacation this week. And uh, judging by uh, the phones and how they've been ringing and not ringing, I, I think uh, probably most people feel the same way. Anyway, happy Independence Day to all my American friends. I posted this week about how it seems like um, Americans are quite solid with the fact that you'd never wish happy um, 4th of July to somebody that lived in another country. But not so many people understand that you can't wish Merry Christmas to somebody who doesn't celebrate Christmas. Somehow we can't seem to make that jump. I don't know why. Anyway, happy Independence Day. I hope your holiday was great. I hope that you're getting good uh, weather to be outside wherever you are. Good morning, Nelly. How are you today? Today we're going to talk about how to write a book. Uh, a lot of people approach me about this topic. I happen to know something about it, some secrets and shortcuts I want to share with you. Um, and before we do that, I want to just give you a couple of updates about some things that are happening for me on this end. One is, good morning, Michelle. Uh, a travel season has officially ended for me now. We finished with an event in Toronto. I spoke at an international convention, a leadership convention. They told me it was a breakout session, but there were 650 people in the room. <laughs> and uh, it was fun. Uh, the uh, speech was being translated into uh, Portuguese. Uh, I'm glad you're doing awesome, Nelly. Thank you. Uh, it was being translated into Portuguese in real time, which was uh, interesting. I I'm not even sure there were any Portuguese people in the room, but uh, there you go. Um, uh, so that's what's in the rearview mirror. In the windshield, we're looking at uh, speaking in Lebanon in May of next year and also in Australia next year. So I'm excited about that. That should be fun. Morning, Michelle. And uh, if you're interested in going to Lebanon, you should message me in this thread or uh, down below or privately because we're going to be going under the rotary umbrella. And if you're ever going to go to the Middle East or uh, uh, actually anywhere you want to go into the rotary umbrella because we've got connections there and it's safer uh, and i don't say that because lebanon's particularly dangerous we just go under the rotary umbrella and we get a lot of things that you wouldn't get if you were just traveling on your own under your own power hey matt good morning um so um uh, that's what we're looking forward to next year a trip a speaking trip to lebanon which you are not ob obligated to go to my talk that's just why i'm going and then a by proxy, we're going to go to uh, some other things. Uh, we're going to visit Beirut, Lebanon, which is called the Paris of the Middle East. And it is beautiful there. It's like going to California. It's lovely. Um, and then the trip to Oz, uh, I think Renee and I are going to take a side trip to New Zealand. Because if you're going to fly that far, you might as well go see New Zealand while you're there. And then we're also planning a trip to Tampa that I'm going to tell you about a little bit, a little bit later in this call. It's a life mastery retreat that anybody can come to. It's going to be quite affordable. And we're going to teach you about things like um, uh, leadership, skill sets, uh, how to increase your vitality. So when we say life mastery, we're not just talking about work stuff. We're talking about work and uh, you stuff, right? Personal stuff, how to have more energy. Uh, and Renee's going to help me with this. So I'm really looking forward to this. It'll, Couples will come. I think uh, business partners will come. It'll be at the famous Saddlebrook Resort in Tampa, and we're looking forward to that. A uh, quick bit of news before we talk about how to write a book. The Boblo boat, uh, one of the Boblo boats, I don't know how many are still around. There used to be three or four, and uh, one of the existing Boblo boats caught fire this week. It was big news here in Detroit because this was a, <laughs> an institution for many, many years, decades in the Detroit area. It goes way, way back. My father, who was a uh, kind of a, well, he was a professional trumpet player because he got paid, but he worked at Ford Motor Company. And on the weekends in the summer, he would ride on the Bob Lowe boat and play dance music 
or entertain the people that were traveling to Bablo Island. So he would he would ride with you on the way to the island, right? You're going to go for the day. Back then, it was an amusement park, everybody. A big amusement park, very famous. It was like the Cedar Point of its time. He would play you over to Bablo Island, and then the people on Bablo Island that were finished would be coming back, right? And he would play you on the way back. And, and uh, he was compensated as a trumpet player and his drummer and his piano player, whoever went. Hi, Russell. Good morning. And... Um, so my dad got a lot of money for playing the Bablo boat. Later, he took uh, my brothers and I to Bablo, uh, and we have photos of this. I just posted one in my Facebook timeline. You could probably see it now. I think you probably have to log off the call, so wait till after the call to look at it. But hi, Sue, good morning. We posted a uh, photo of me as a kid with my brothers and a cousin. And then later, as a musician myself, my brothers and I played an electric version because my dad was all acoustic, right? Trumpet, piano, drums. My brothers and I toured, you know, the Bablo boat thing um, as a pop band. And we didn't take you to the island. We took you on a Bablo cruise. This was a way Bablo made more money using the boats. And it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of work to get on that boat with all of our gear. But it was a unique gig for us. We did it se several summers in a row. And, and there's a, I had posted a photo of a ticket price. I think it was from 1991 that my brother Dave turned me on to in my Facebook timeline. Again, you can look at that after we hang up. But the Bablo boat, one of the only existing Bablo boats caught fire this week. It was big news. And I've been flashing back about, about Bablo. Bablo is now not an amusement park. It has been developed. There are people living on the island and uh, things have changed. Time has moved on. Hey, let's talk about how to write a book, everybody. Uh, please type into the comment section if you're interested in writing a book. What do you have in mind? Maybe a memoir, maybe a piece of fiction, a novel. Maybe you want to write a self-help book, maybe a storybook of some kind. Maybe you want to... Um, uh, help people with some aspect of an industry, right? Um, so uh, I have authored a few books. Uh, I just want to show you quickly that, that this can be done. Now, these are called perfect bound books. This format here, this is the latest book. It's called Work Hacks. This is called perfect bound because you see the spine? Like this is glued. <laughs> this is glued, right? And this particular book has uh, 168 pages, right? Similar with the Five Cool Ideas book here. Again, a perfect bound book. And the reason I'm showing you this is you can, of course, for your first effort, do a perfect bound book. But the more um, hefty the book is, the more expensive it will be for you to produce. And if you've never sold the book, that's the real interesting challenge. I'd like to have a dollar for everybody that has come up to me in my life and said, I want to write a book or I should write a book. And I always correct them. I say, no, you should sell a book, man, because that's really where the effort comes in, right? It's, it's rather easy to write a book, and I'm being facetious because it's not easy. But I'm going to show you a trick that makes it a lot easier in this call. It's rather easy to write a book. It is much, much more difficult to sell the book. And for that reason, I, start, I would suggest you start with these shortcuts. You should write them down. And I will put uh, some Cliff's Notes version of this in the, in the show notes a little bit later. Good morning, Martin. Martin's calling in from Great Britain, I believe. Melissa from New York. I think she's in New York. How are you? Um, so uh, if you're writing a book for the first time and you don't have a lot of money to put into this, you don't have a budget, uh, I would suggest you start with something simple like a top 10 report. Like Melissa Ward's really t uh, talented at social media. She could do a quick uh, tip sheet on 10 things, 10 ways to get more out of your Facebook page, right? And she publishes this as a PDF, right? You convert your Word document to a PDF. Congratulations, you are a published author. <laughs> There's no cost in this. It was free for you to do it, minus your time. And now you can offer this on your, via your website. You can offer it for a dollar. You can offer it free. You can offer it for $10 if you want to. I don't think you'll sell any copies of a tip sheet for $10, but you might. And now you can, you can expand that tip sheet. Now that you have what we call in the business proof of concept, right? We know people are interested. Now you can go to work uh, perhaps 
spending some money to produce a perfect bound book, right? That would be, that would cost you three or $4 per copy to produce. You see, because if you order a hundred books and they cost you $4, it's going to cost you $400 plus shipping just to take delivery on the books. And you haven't sold one of them yet. That's the idea. Hey, Jordan Thomas, how are you brother? So, um, the, this tip sheet is the easiest way to go. It's very low barrier to entry. And if you feel uh, emboldened, you can also create an ebook. And I've done many of them. An ebook is can be anywhere between 10 and 30 pages, right? If it's much more than that, it's hard for people to f actually follow up and read it online. They, it's too burdensome for them to print at home. And so 10 to 30 pages is about the uh, size of an ebook, also free to you. It will take more time to do an ebook. There'll be more bulk to it, right? Um, and then eventually you might want to go, now uh, e-publishing is fine, but it doesn't feel like being an author. You know, you're not taking delivery on a product like, like uh, you know, a physical, there's nothing like having your name in print, right? Look, by Michael Angelo Caruso, right? I remember when I first saw my name in print, it was such a kick, it still is a kick. But you have to have a system for selling the book in order for the system <laughs> to reward you, right? I don't know why my voice keeps cracking today. Like I'm still in puberty to reward you, right? So low barrier to risk, low barrier to entry, low risk. I would suggest doing a booklet. See the difference between the book and the booklet. This is 164 pages. This is 36 pages. And the way you do this, I want to show you this. So this, uh, just a little uh, perspective, this is called little, uh, hmm, little Ideas with Big Results. And when I sell it, I don't sell it as a book. I sell it as a booklet, right? Because I don't want to mislead people. What do you mean you, 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 you sold me this book for, and it's only got 36 pages in it, I want a refund. So I always tell people it's a booklet. I tell them it's 36 pages. By the way, it's a top seller for me because it turns out people like 36 page books sometimes more than they like 164 page books. So keep that in mind as you're getting ready to do your product, you know, write something that people are actually gonna follow up in and read. And you can see how, hey Linda, good morning. Or Lena, sorry, Lena, good morning. So this is, um, this is a booklet and you'll see, unlike the other book I just showed you, which is glued, right? This is a glued book because there are so many pages, the spine, you can see in the spine, it's glued. This book is either stapled in the middle or glued like this one is. This one is glued in the middle, right? And the reason they can do that is because it's only 36 pages. So you're learning a little bit about book manufacturing, book construction. Now, in the old days, we used to actually have to get a printer to do the book. You'd have to, <laughs> you'd have to call the printer, send them a deposit. They'd have to do something called the galley. They'd send the galley to you. You'd sign off on the galley, and then you'd have to order. You have no choice about the minimum order. You'd have to order 500 <laughs> or 5,000, right? And if you, just, if you think you've got 500 friends that will buy your first book, you are way mistaken. No, this never happens. So you were stuck in the old days, in the printing business days, when books were done, uh, printed differently, you were stuck with 500 books. I remember the first you know, time I ordered a book, I, my ego started getting the best of me. I ordered you know, 500 books, no problem. I'll sell this over the weekend. <laughs> I had a pallet of books in my garage for like two years. You know, When I moved from that house, I had to have the pallet moved to the next house. Right? That's how it worked because it took so long, especially if you didn't have a head of steam, it took so long to sell the book. So that's the advantage of having a low barrier to entry. If this book costs $4 to produce, this booklet only costs $2 to produce. So you're less money out of pocket. But things have gotten even better since then because of something called POD, which is called print on demand. I think it's even in Norway, Lena. And if it's not in Norway, you can order POD and have it shipped. The idea is to do POD so you don't have to have it shipped. If there's a POD manufacturer in your town, you go pick up the books, you even save on shipping, you understand? So 
when I order now, I order P-O-D, because if I'm writing a new book, I don't know if people are going to buy it. I've had some good selling products, but I don't know for sure people are going to buy it. So I test it with P-O-D, because P-O-D is I want to order 25 copies or 50 copies or 100 copies, you see, just to test it. Or maybe a single client has, has commissioned me to write a book. This could happen for you too. A single person or a single client commissions you to buy the book. You would only want to produce 100 because that's all they want. You may not sell it after that, right? So we produce books these days for different purposes. We don't produce it necessarily to become a New York Times bestseller. We produce it because somebody's paying us to write a book and, sell, and, and buy 100 copies of the book from us. It's possible. So you may discover this. Um, so uh, here's the tip. Now, if you move from uh, electronic version of something to a printed version of something, you want to go with this low barrier to entry, which is this printed, stapled, <laughs> glued booklet, right? And I want to show you how to do it. Now, the format of this book is very simple. This is called a compilation book, which means it doesn't have a beginning and a middle and an end, right? So I can... I can get ideas. I wake up on a Thursday with an idea. I drop it into my folder, either a, a real folder or an electronic folder for the idea for this book. And the original title of this book was, you see how it says 11, 11 small ways to make big improvements in your life. The original title of this book was aha, not hmm, and seven small ways. It was around the time of the Stephen Covey seven habits of effective people. And I thought, well, Stephen Covey did the research. Seven's an important number. And then I thought, well, hell, I'll, I've got 11 ideas. Why sack four of them? I'll make, I don't want to be too much like Stephen Covey, right? I went from being, wanting to be like Stephen Covey, exactly, to, to not even being close. <laughs> so it became 11 small ideas, right? And here was the premise that I would have a cover page of some kind. I didn't know what the artwork was going to look like. I would have an author page of some kind. I didn't know where it would be, but let's say it was going to be on the back cover, right? And it turns out the back cover is not the place to do your author page. That's where you want to put testimonials. So you send advanced copies of your book to somebody, right? People to get testimonials. So they would read your book. They would say, this book is great. And then they would, you could put the testimonials on the back cover of the book because there's an old saying, people judge a book by its cover. You're not supposed to do that, but people do it. And so you always want the back cover to be a selling piece, right? So more people would buy the book because other people said good things about it than the fact that my bio was on the back with my picture, right? So that's the ideal way to do that. But let me just show you how this works. This is called, if you opened up to the center of the book, or any page actually, if I just open up to the first page, this is called the printer's spread. It's an old terminology, printer's spread. And this is called the cover page right? Or inside matter. There's, sorry, front matter. Front matter in the front of the book, back matter in the back of the book. So front matter are things like the title page, table of contents, forward, preface, right? In a booklet, I don't have all those things. It's too short. In the back end of the book, the back matter are things like uh, recommended resources, bibliography, uh, could be a, about the author page in the back. So if you, if, you just, if you just page through here, you can see, there it is. There's a dedication. There's the table of contents. This is all front matter. Turns out there is an introduction in this book. And then the pattern for this book, and this is what I want you to copy if you care to, because writing a book is filled. You're filled with decisions, and every decision is a crossroad, and every crossroad is an excuse for you not to finish the book. So I'm trying to help you get through these decisions. So decide that you're going to do a booklet versus a, 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 a legitimate book. Decide that it will have a certain front matter and back matter. And decide that you're going to have this format. You're going to have an aphorism on this page. And you're going to have the, a vignette that illustrates the aphorism on the opposing page. You with me? Because if you decide on that format, you can carry that format throughout the book, let. You see? Now, these aphorisms are interesting. Uh, my father was not doing well at the time of this book. And I was filled with, um, 
I was filled with sadness and a lot of melancholy at the time because my father was, I knew my father was probably passing and it turns out I was right. And so the idea was, was that I would, uh, I, I was going to, I was going to pay tribute to my dad. It turned out it was going to pay tribute to my dad uh, by using some of his aphorisms, right? Now, this one is mine. Find something that you like about people you don't like. My dad used to say this, you can never, ever change another person, right? And so uh, this is not copyright material. My dad wasn't upset. In fact, he I liked it that I used his material. He liked it that I, you know, like most kids, like most fathers, he liked it when, when the son adopted his philosophy. So my dad never wrote a book, right? So I, I ended up dedicating the book to my dad. It, it all works out great. But you can never, ever change another person. That aphorism, which worked so well for, for my brothers and me while I was growing up, that aphorism, it turns out, is valuable to other people as well. You, you understand? Okay. And then uh, people don't like to take orders. They like to take part and on and on. There are 11 of them, right? Keep your antenna up. That, Right, this is before the digital age. So this one didn't age so well. And then in the back, there's back matter, is there? Oh yeah, I promote a couple of other products in the back, right? So you could put whatever you want in the back matter, you see? And it turned out to be 36 pages. So here's what I want you to do as you get your act together. You take some paper like this, this is just an eight and a half by 11 copy paper, and you could take just 10 pages. I'm just gonna take three pages just to illustrate right I took three pages watch this is so cool this is how you flesh out your idea three pages I'm gonna fold them in half like this and look what I've just done oops I've created a, a, a prototype of a booklet now what I can do watch I can create, I can mock up a cover and a back cover. So the cover is, a, you know, a photo of something, right? The back cover is about the author, if I decide to go that route. And then inside there would be the, 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 what's called the TOC or the Table of Contents. And if I was going to go the route of aphorisms, you know, things my mother said, right? I could do the, um, the aphorism and then I, like, just like I did, just like I showed you, there's the aphorism, there's the, uh, that's the title of the aphorism, the aphorism itself, and then there's the vignette or the story that explains the aphorism, right? Hi, Renee. Hi, Russell. How are you? Uh, Russell's got a question we'll answer. Christina, good morning. How are you? Russell's question is, in your opinion, how should I start with our book? Um, so Russell and I have talked about doing a book together, or I think it was more about me coaching him through a book. Um, and maybe we should talk about specific advice, Russell, offline. But if there's something that you think it would be helpful to other people on this call, tell me more about what you have in mind and we'll, we'll explore it right now. So imagine if you had five aphorisms or seven, you just create that pattern throughout the book. And this is called, because I worked at a newspaper company for a while back in the days where you used um, light tables and wax, you know, to lay down the, <laughs> the copy. And we called it dummying up a page. We would dummy up the page. And that's really what you've done with this. You've dummied up the so this, this might stay blank for a long time because if you only have four or five ideas, dummy up the first four. So the book starts to take shape, you see. One of the biggest problems in writing a book, everybody, is you're going to get waylaid over and over. And it occurs to me, Matt Maris has a hell of a story. Matt, I remember your story, man. And it is, I, I hope things are going for what, well for you these days. But you got a story that's one of the best I've ever heard about how you're making it through this world. And uh, I don't know if you ever care to share it, uh, but, but everybody's got a story. Everybody's got something, you know, intellectual property, or maybe it's a, uh, maybe it's, um, maybe it's an imagination, a, 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 fi a fiction, they call it, right? If it's nonfiction, it's true. It happened. If it's fiction, it hasn't happened, but it's in your head. It doesn't matter if you're writing a book, 
staying on track is going to be your biggest problem. It takes, here's another fellow author, Keith Sanders, Rich Lally's on the call. Hi, Rich. Uh, it takes about 18 months to birth a, a, a book like this, you know, uh, 165 pages, 164 pages. It could take just as long or longer to do a booklet, right? I keep trying to show you this spine. Six, 16, uh, sorry, 36 pages. But you just keep getting delayed and waylaid, especially if you've never done it before. That's why I'm showing you this process for creating a prototype book, right? And this is what you do to do it. This is how you do it. And if you want to ask any questions, now's a good time to do it. Good morning, Tim Murphy, my friend from Minnesota. Good to see you in Toronto. It was so fun in Toronto at this convention because you just run into people and, and have an a impromptu conversation. And you couldn't plan. I planned to meet people in Toronto, and I couldn't because there were 25, 30, I think 25,000 people, 27,000 people at this event. But we ran into Tim Murphy one day. The exhibit hall hadn't even barely opened, and there's Tim Murphy. It was great. So um, that's how, and you start with small, everybody. You start small with one book, and then this was my second, right? And this is my third. This happened last year. And before I'm done, I'm going to have a compendium of books. I'm going to have a, 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 a library. I'm going to have a, uh, an arc to my, to, my, to my career, right? And then later, what you can do is you can package your products together, and people will buy the packages as a deal. When I'm at events, some of you know, I, I package my books together, right? Because because I'll give you a deal if you're interested, if you're really interested in what I do, I'll give you a deal to buy. And then I got into other products besides books, DVDs, right? It turns out not everybody likes to read. So uh, I recorded, uh, I, rec I recorded an, um, an audio book. I've recorded audio versions of my books. I'm now working on a book on effective leadership that will be out, I think, around Christmas time. And so the, the, just the process continues, and it all starts with something cheesy like this. So I hope this has been helpful for you as you, get, uh, as you go on your journey for being an author. Um, those of you in your life that are thinking about making changes, like writing a book, imagining yourself differently, maybe um, changing jobs, maybe leaving your job, because it's time for you to grow into your greatness, I call it. And I know that Russell Luce is interested in this. Uh, I'm hosting an event in November, on uh, November 2nd and 3rd, to talk about this kind of stuff, how to, how to move from where you are now to where you want to be, right? If it's becoming an author, or if it's become, becoming a consultant, or starting your own company, or, or launching a product, or perhaps it's getting a promotion at the job and the career that you really do love. Because uh, there's an old saying that if you could have done it yourself, you would have done it already right? Um, I also say that you can do this stuff, but it might take you 20 or 30 years. I can help you speed up that, that, uh, that timeline if you care to have it sped up. Some people want to just take it easy and just, you know, grow into it. But on November 2nd and 3rd, we're going to be at the Saddlebrook Resort in Tampa. I say we because Renee and I are hosting this event. It's called the Life Mastery Retreat. You can Google it up, Life Mastery Retreat, Michelangelo Caruso, or you can just look into the show notes. I'm going to put it in the comment section when we hang up. Hi, Laura. How are you? Laura's got some stories, too. She works in healthcare. <laughs> you, could write, you could write a really good book, Laura. Um, and um, so on November 2nd and 3rd, we're going to help people do this type of thing. Uh, we're going to help you with your vitality. We're going to help you with time management. We're going to help you uh, do whatever you want. There'll be time for one-on-one -on -one coaching if you want. But we're going to get you to this Saddlebrook Resort because it turns out, and you know this on a holiday week, when you're on the treadmill and you're working all the time, you can't reimagine yourself. You have to be in a place of relaxation. You have to be in a place where you're calm right, and centered because if you're off balance, you can't take anything else in. Your brain can't handle it. Your head will explode. And so we work to get you to, we want you to get you to a resort type atmosphere. That's why I do my retreats in nice places where you can relax and have a lot of fun and enjoy the amenities. And I don't do lectures, right? There's no guru worship at this event, right? 
I see some of these uh, big events where you're like bowing down to the master. I'm like, oh my gosh. So um, uh, no guru worship. And we just have conversation to talk about how to get you from point A to point B as fast as possible. And we've had great success with this. If you look at the webpage for the Tampa event, you'll see what people say about this type of training when we do it right. Russell says, uh, or get a great coach. Thank you very much, Russell. Uh, Russell did some great things. He's in the financial services business and um, his numbers have been extraordinary. He just got another big award. I think it's called, Russell, type it in if you will, five star award or something from uh, a financial services uh, association that monitors this, monitors this type of thing. And his year over year numbers have been fantastic. And I can't take all the credit for this. Russell is the man, right? He's really good at what he does but we've been working in a coaching capacity for some time and it's worked out really good for him and I'm so happy for him. Russell's now looking at a new house. Uh, he's looking at changing jobs because he's kind of outgrown his terrific company maybe. Uh, I don't know if I should say that on recording, Russell, uh, but I think all people are looking to change jobs. I think everybody's looking for the next opportunity. Hi, Kirk, how are you? Funny story, Russell. Uh, I, was, uh, I was working at a job one time and this is back in the fax machine days. And I, and I had felt I had outgrown my job. And I, I faxed my resume to another company. And I left it in the fax machine overnight. <laughs> and the boss came in and beat me to work the next day. My boss finds the fax in the machine. Oh, my gosh. And she pulls me into her office. And she says, what's this about? And, and I said, well, uh, as you can see, I, I, I polished my resume. And I was sending it out. And she said, well, uh, are you, uh, are you looking for another opportunity? And I said, why, yes, isn't everyone? And I don't know if she expected that answer, but I think it was totally honest on my part. Isn't everyone always looking for a better opportunity? And, and your manager, your boss is, and if you're a boss, you should always be cognizant of this, that people are always looking for opportunities. That's your boss's opportunity to create a better, uh, a better offer for you or a better environment for you at your current job. We're always looking for opportunities. I read, by the way, yes, thank you, Russell. I, I, I understand. <laughs> uh, Five-star professional wealth manager of the year for six consecutive years. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, and so um, uh, Russell can choose to stay where he's at. For He can retire from there, and so can you. But I think everybody is wise to look at other opportunities and look at ways that you can provide better for your family. I think you should look at ways that being, living, a, living a less stressful life. And that's the kind of stuff we're going to talk about November 2nd and 3rd in Tampa. So if you have any other questions, type them in now. There's a little time lag between when I ask for questions and when I actually see them. Um, so if I miss it live, I will look for your message after the video has rendered and I will answer in the comment section. I hope this has been helpful for you as we talked about how you can become a, a published author and go from this to this. It's pretty cool. I wish that for you and keep me posted on your progress. Okay. I'm happy to help along the way. Thanks everybody. Enjoy the weekend.